Welcome to the Get in the Fight podcast. My name is Nate Whitson, and I'm the founder of Get in the Fight Ministries and our exclusive online fight club for Christian men. Everything we do here is dedicated to helping Christian men become the men that God meant for them to be. So if you're looking for helpful content and conversations that can help you to grow and become the man that God made you to be, then you're in the right place. But before we get started, please do me a huge favor and be sure to subscribe, click the like button, and then leave us a five-star review. Doing that helps us to reach more men who are looking for content just like this. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our mission and how to get involved or how to join the Fight Club, then head on over to getinthefight.club. That's getinthefight.club and learn more today. But without further ado, it's time to get in the fight. So let's go. Hey guys, welcome to the Get in the Fight podcast. I'm your host, Nate Whitson. And if you're new to the Get in the Fight podcast, this is a place for Christian men who are really wanting to push the boundaries from status quo and just going through the motions. It's it's a place for Christian men who want to live bigger, better lives and become the men that God meant for them to be. And, and we hope that's you. If, if you're listening to this, or maybe even you just know that guy, maybe you're married to that guy and you're listening to this and go like, my husband needs to hear this, right? Send this to a friend, share it on your social media, get engaged with us in some kind of way. But you'll find me on Instagram. You can find our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to getinthefight.club and learn a lot more about what we do. But our heart and soul is really about helping men fight and, and realizing how many of us really feel kind of alone in this journey. And so today is a continuation of uh, a series of podcasts that we call Fight Club Stories. So in inside of our ministry called Get in the Fight, you will uh, find that there's a private exclusive group called our Fight Club. And it's a place which, by the way, uh, you can join and apply at getinthefight.club. It's free to join. Um, there's an application process that you go through where I meet with you one on one and just learn more, more about your story and set expectations. But in these Fight Club stories, what you will hear is just a man in his journey. And one thing that we know and we find out quickly is that we all have stories. We all have burdens that we carry. Uh, we all have things deep inside of us that we think, gosh, I hope nobody knows or finds this out. And yet, it's how the enemy works against us. And so as we share our stories, we figure out, you know what? I'm not alone in this. I'm not the only guy who's been through this. We've had fight club stories where guys have thought, you know, when they were young, they were going to commit suicide and God kind of protected them and led them to them. We've had guys who have shared some stories of just children that are in pain and hurting and dying and how they're dealing with that and, and stories of abuse and trauma and just all kinds of things. And so, you know, I encourage you to listen to these stories and just hear how much encouragement there is when men get together and share their stories. So today's Fight Club story involves a good friend of mine uh, named Nate Byrons. Nate actually has been on the show before. And episode number 13, we talked about dealing with anger. And we talked about some of the things that Nate brings to the table in his job working for the state. And we may or may not get to some of that. But if you want to listen to more about emotional intelligence, dealing with anger, Nate's a, a, a pro in that thing, in that kind of space and offers a lot of wisdom. So episode 13, we'll put it in the show notes, by the way, and you can click on that and, and listen to more of that. But without further ado, Nate, thanks for jumping on the show today. Absolutely. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. I love these podcasts and I love hearing the stories. So hopefully I can say something of, of insight that might, somebody might be able to take away. Yeah. You know, what's funny, like when you say that, like, whenever I ask guys to come on, that's always the idea. And that's how I would feel too. I'm like, who am I? What, are, <laughs> what do I have that anybody would need? The reality yeah. is everybody's story truly does matter. Yeah. Right. And you know, this in the work that you do, it's like when you're dealing with emotional intelligence, when you're dealing with people, the psyche of a man matters mm. so, so much. Mm. And there's a lot of underlying stories that lead us to that point. But so many of us feel like, well, who am I? My story doesn't matter. It's not as dramatic as the next guy. And yet your story today, Nate, just like, you know, Ryan's and Matt's and all these other guys that have been on the show, they all matter because somebody is going to listen today. And we know that they're going to go, man, his story sounds a lot like my story. <laughs> and if it's just for that one guy, yeah. Yeah. right, this is this is how the Lord speaks to us through his people. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll just we'll discount that feeling that we all feel and we'll just yeah. jump into it. So take us into your story, Nate, maybe let's go to the beginning, kind of lay the groundwork. Like what is, 
young Nathaniel Byron's <laughs> life like? Were you yeah. always Nate Byron's? Tell us some of these stories about <laughs> yeah. who yeah, you are. Certainly not. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, I, I come from, I have an interesting background and, and we live in America, so there's a lot of people with this background, but I'm pretty much a first generation American. And so uh, my mom is, is Hispanic. She was born and raised in Guatemala. She's 50% Spanish, European Spanish, and then Guatemalan. And then my biological dad is 100% Lebanese, which is why you see a Lebanese flag. I'm not pro Hezbollah at all. <laughs> just, just to throw that out there. Yeah, let's put I'm that just, out there right I, now. Yeah. yeah, I love Lebanese food. I grew up in a Lebanese household. But he, his family, well, before he was born, immigrated to Guatemala. And so <clears throat> I, I grew up in a household where, you know, Spanish and Arabic were spoken primarily and then English. And in fact, I didn't know English until I was probably like four or five, hmm. something like that. <clears throat> so... I feel like to, to kind of give people context, my parents, my, my biological dad and my mom got together under terrible, like under terrible pretense. Like they, my mom came out of a household where nobody looked out for her. Um, terrible things were done to her. Terrible things were allowed to be done to her on behalf of her mother. And my dad had a ton of hurt as well just learning about him he he hated his mom because she did terrible things to his dad he really admired his dad and then things happen to him and so when you grow up and you don't have the resources to be able to understand the process and be able to overcome those things you kind of carry those with you and i and i've not always explained that scenario mm -hmm. as gener as generic as i have with that much empathy <laughs> before my life this has been a recent a recent phenomenon for me but so anyways my, my mom you know was young she's working at a bar in guatemala and she just expects every guy to treat her like garbage and so she runs into my dad who's running the bar and you know i don't know how graphic i i, I want to get with this but they my mom got pregnant without unwillingly let's say mm -hmm. right yeah you can kind of do the math there. And so, you know, she, she just thought, you know, I'm on my own. Here's another guy that treated me in the way I expect all men to treat me, but I think I need to hold on to this baby. I feel like God, whoever I believe God she, you know, is, wants me to keep this baby. And she was pressured into abortion. You know, she never did it. So my biological dad's like, fine, then we have to get married. You know, very, very traditional in, in some sense. And so, they were married. They moved up to the United States in the Lansing. I was born shortly thereafter. And but it was very, a very toxic, abusive relationship. And I don't have a ton of memories of my parents being together. The only memories I have, I see myself in third person. I remember my dog getting hit by a car in front of our house in Lansing. I remember our house caught on fire and I was stuck upstairs. And my mom had to come and get me. And that's why she has like scarring on her arm. And then I remember my mom chasing my dad into the bathroom with a knife and her just like, boom, boom, boom. And growing up, I truly thought those were just like weird dreams or nightmares that I had. Hmm. Like, and it wasn't until I was in my twenties, I said, I told my mom, I go, Hey, did this happen? Because I, I, I remember seeing myself see it. Hmm. Right. I don't remember seeing it from first person. She's like, yeah, the house caught on fire and you were, you were the only one in the house. You were stuck upstairs. So I had to run and get you. And then I, I was like, what about this? <laughs> I remember my dad running into the bathroom, shutting the door and you were like, you know, like Chucky, just da -da -da, you know, up against the door. <laughs> I'm like, did that really happen? She was, that was the last thing your dad ever hit me. Mm. I'm like, wow. Okay. Truly. Those mm. are the only memories I have and they don't feel like memories. Uh, and so I can't imagine like the other stuff I saw that just, I don't remember, which is like a coping mechanism. And and so then my, my parents split up and my dad, you know, he had full custody of us. And as far as I could tell, he, I think he did his best, but there were things that he did. He was not, he was not a good, honest man, you know, um, 
I grew up like I, I would find in, in this, I'm kind of bringing all this together at some point, just to give you context. No, this is good. He, like I, I used to find like, he had like a driver's license. He had like two of them. And one said Robert Vasilla, which is his real name. The other one said Roberto Ferris. And I just remember thinking, Hey, who's, who's Roberto Ferris? He's like, Oh, that's me. I go, well, who's Robert Vasilla? He's like, that's also me. <laughs> and as a kid, you're like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Not confusing like, at all. Just, yeah. You just have two different names. Well, Obviously, he was doing some, you know, things that were a bit unsavory under that name. And so, you know, he, he the reason why he got full custody is he, he told my mom, who had to teach herself English, how to teach herself how to drive, how to teach herself how to survive in another country that she knew nobody, right? He, he told her, hey, you have to sign these papers or else you're getting deported. Come to find out those were custody papers. Wow. So he had, he had manipulated her, a woman who was away from her kids. A woman who was just trying to survive she didn't ask for any of this correct you know it's like didn't ask to come here didn't ask to get pregnant didn't ask to get you know taken advantage of and so my mom eventually meets pastor steve meets steve and they meet at a bar and this is before you know they, they knew christ and immediately i connected with steve it, like first day I could tell instantly, like this guy wants to be around me. He wants to play with me. He want, like he wants, he's an, he's an, uh, interested in me. And that was the first time I ever felt like, oh, and then I have this guy who's my dad. I don't feel that way with him when I'm around him. And so, you know, if you have like no other baseline, you kind of take what you get. But I had, uh, I had this other guy who instantly wanted to to pick me up, play with me, mm -hmm. just ha have fun with me. And so as flawed as my parents were at that moment, like, I'll take it. Like, this was awesome. Mm -hmm. And so years, you know, years go by and my, you know, my mom and Steve get married. They have my little sister, Anna and me and Daphne are going back and my sister, my older sister, Daphne, we, we go back and forth to my dad's and to my mom's until one day in third grade, I'm, I'm primarily living with my dad still. My dad shows up in the middle of class. Hey, as quickly as this, hey, tell your friends goodbye. You don't go to school here anymore. What? He goes, say goodbye. That same day, I say goodbye. He drives me to Olivet, puts me in. I, I go to front person's now on the second half of the day. <laughs> and it's just like, what is going on? And uh, my dad's like, I'm, I'm going to be leaving for a while. And coming to find out, he was going to jail in like a Wisconsin jail for like a year. Hmm. And so I had no idea why I come to find out he, you know, he had a gambling problem and was writing checks under his brother's names and then they caught up to him. And so here, here's kind of like my dad in a nutshell. When he got back, I was in fourth grade. And the first thing he said to me was, you didn't write to me enough. Like, okay. Fourth and I'm in grade fourth grade. And, so I, how, I was going to say, yeah, how old are you? Fourth grade. <laughs> nine, nine, ten. 10. Yeah. And so the, the, the feeling that I grew up, even I'm, I'm being real, even into my thirties was when I think of my dad going to jail for a year, I think of primarily I failed him. Hmm. Not that he failed me and made a bad choice. I truly never thought that way. I never thought my dad, what a bum he left. No, it was, I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough. Which is twisted. Yeah. It's twisted. No doubt. And so I literally carried a feeling of like, dang, I could have wrote him more. I should have wrote him more. I didn't do enough. And then that that kind of mentality carried on throughout high school and college of like, I would go out of my way to try to please him. Mm. And he always found fault or flaw into in, in, in the manner in which I would try to meet his needs and please him, whether it's spending time or money or, you know, how I talked with him. And it was just never enough. But you have that kind of natural connection where it's like, but I want you to accept me. Like, do you, are you pleased with me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was, that was him. And so I grew up being so angry and angry toward him, but at the same time feeling like I'm under his thumb. Like I, like I, you know, whether I knew it or not, I just wanted his acceptance. And this is a common, this is a common story here, which is why being a father who's engaged and more importantly, loves the Lord 
is so important. Mm -hmm. But so that's my dad. My mom didn't find out till I was 30. She's bipolar, which makes total sense. The amount of abuse she took and how she, her brain was trying to cope with, you know, the horrors of what she went through in the third world country and in, in America. So I grew up having, my mom was always loving, but at the same time, like a, on a switch, she, she could flip into somebody you just don't feel safe around. Um, she was the disciplinarian. She, so here's the two realities of, of, of living with my mom. She was a better mom than she had any right to be. She mm -hmm. was also a person that caused immense damage emotionally and physically. And for her, it was just like, this is nothing compared to what I got, right? This is her story she's telling herself. And so in a way she did improve, but it was still so over the line, mm -hmm. you know, for in, like, I know, I know there are men out there that ha have experienced a lot more abuse, but I, I didn't live their story. So I, I can't like say, oh, what I went through isn't as bad. And so if there's anybody out there that's saying, oh, I know somebody had it worse than me. That's, that's an unhelpful story to tell yourself because you still aren't saying like, ah, what I went through was wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to acknowledge like when something is wrong, that somebody wronged you, like it's okay, like you were wronged. Yep. And sometimes there's nothing can be done about it. Nothing could have been done about it. But to say, yeah, that was wrong. That was wrong. I think, I think a lot of people avoid saying that they carry responsibility or, you know, because parents can be very manipulative. So my mom would, she would do things that would, you know, divide me and my sister. Like when my sister would get a spanking, she'd say, Nate, we'll pick out the belt, mm. which is like, like pretty crazy. Yeah. Like I, that doesn't even cross my mind. Like go pick, go pick up the belt, Jojo. And it's just like, so like me and my sister were in a fight. I'm like, I'm, I know the perfect belt for that. Mm. You know, like mm. pretty twisted, but you grew yeah. up with it and you normalize it. My mom, when she'd get really angry, she'd maybe strip down completely and pull out the extension cord, you know? And, and so what happens is I, I say, all right, this woman is crazy. Uh, women are crazy mm -hmm. and women manipulate men with emotions. I grew up and I, that was like one of my sacred core beliefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why I know it was core beliefs because it, it played a role in my marriage uh, of I'm viewing how my wife is using emotion as a way to try to manipulate me. Yep. And so there's very low trust, very low trust at the same time. Like who else can I go to and lean on, but my parents. And so it's just like, I don't want to lean on them, but I, I kind of, that's all I have. And so that continued. She wasn't diagnosed until I was in my thirties. And so we're just like saying eh, that's just how it is. And the things, the things you would say, we're just confidence crushers. You know, my mom would just make me feel like either like a little boy or, or like I was never a man. Mm -hmm. And that was because all the men that she had known had violated her. And so while I can understand it, it's still unacceptable. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, I, you know, I can, I have a ton of empathy for my mom and I don't hold those things against her anymore, but they were, I grew up, uh, just zero confidence, zero self-esteem. And so I had terrible, terrible grades and like less than a two point. And my teachers gave me the contract. Like, what do you like? Why, why aren't you, you don't seem to care. And I'm like, I don't, why would I care about this? Why would I care about school paperwork when I don't like truly like feel safe at home? Yeah. I don't know where I belong. Yeah. I don't know where I belong. I love Steve and Steve loved me, but he felt like he was always stepping on bi my biological dad's toes. And so I had two guys that were sparring in a way that it's like, it's like they were fighting over here and I'm just standing here like, is anybody going to pick me up? Is anybody going to claim me? <laughs> right. Like That's like my sentiment. I said, like, is anybody going to claim me? Yeah. I need to be claimed or else I'm just kind of wandering on my own. And truth be told is I think Steve did his best, but his dad was pretty removed. And I, so I do think he did his best. I think my biological dad did his best, but it still, still wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even when my parents became Christians, a lot of good things happened and changed. He was a lot more intentional. 
but the bar was so low for me that I'm like, I just liked having a fun dad that wanted to be around me. But I, I wanted somebody to say, like, you're mine. I'm going to build you up. I think that's what men need and women need. Mm-hmm. That's why both parents are so important. It's like we need a landing spot to start building our foundation of who we are as a, as a man. Yep. And I never felt like I had that because I felt I had to play moderator between my parents. Mm. And that's another crappy thing about divorces. Like your kids will try to play peacemaker. And then kids will sometimes get pulled into the politics of a divorce or a marriage. And we're just not capable of handling that. And it is a confidence crusher. It is a self-esteem crusher. It is, it is something that makes you question where you belong. And if you don't, know how to take care of it, which most kids don't. And parents back then hadn't, I mean, I don't know how prominent counseling was, but you grow up holding that in, you kind of carterize the wounds and just move on Mm -hmm. because humans are resilient. God made them to endure a lot. But what happens is like that scar tissue is there. And so then as you grow up, you go to college, you meet a wife, these things get triggered again. And you're like, I have no idea. I feel like a freaking monster right now. Mm -hmm. I always, I always struggled with anger because I, I didn't anger for me in the household growing up was the only control I had. It was the only emotion that I could use to let people like to disrupt whatever was happening to me. And it was like my way of kind of like my loud roar. Like Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't control my environment. I can't control what you do to me, but you can, you can know that like, I'm going to be defiant and I'm going to, you know, kind of let my voice be heard. And when you grow up, you don't need to do that anymore, mm-hmm. but you don't really revisit that and say, Oh, that's why I went, I, you know, that's why I, I tend to lash out or have this pent up anger, and just explode or feel violated so often. It's because I'm looking for it. Mm-hmm. And if you look for it, you're always going to find it. And so I go to college, I go to Christian college. I grew up, I, I did grow up in a youth group. I, I, I knew Christ. But it was like a lot of kids say, kind of borrowed from my parents. You know, you have very little perspective. You're in a very contained, safe environment. You go off to college, you think you're an adult. You get in relationships, you start messing around with girls. You get lucky, Mm -hmm. as in like you don't suffer the consequences of what you ought to. And that's when, and and me and Nate were just talking about this before. It's like, I would love our kids, my daughters, his daughters, to not have to learn by experience in some of these areas as much as we can avoid it'd be great for them to avoid so but i got lucky several times when it came with even my life having another you know having a kid when i'm not supposed to in in a lot of ways more ways than i can count probably and so that's when i said you know i had important people come into my life and kind of take me in and that that was that was like the most loving thing is for like somebody to say hey let let i got your back let me help you out and i grew up feeling like i'm on my own i've got to do things on my own in college my parents moved to guatemala to become missionaries and that's when there was a part of me that kind of was just like all right i have to i have to figure things out on my own and by the grace of god he's always allowed me to seek out people that i think i could trust and that were Christ followers and and that really wanted to build me up. And that was a journey that like, even to this day, is like a non-negotiable. I've got to be around people that I can build up and that can build me up and that I can trust. And so that that's the common thread of God's grace in my life is for some reason, he allowed me to seek those people out and they responded and reciprocated. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. And if you are, please do me a big favor and simply get engaged in a simple way. For you, that might be clicking the like button or maybe subscribing to the show. For others, it may be commenting on a show that really stands out to them, or maybe it's just copying the URL and texting it to a friend or pasting that into your social media or sharing it via text, whatever it is. All of those things make a huge difference for us, and it helps us to reach more Christian men who are trying to live bigger and better lives. So number one, thank you for being a listener and thank you for being a part of this community and part of this show. We appreciate it more than you know, and we appreciate you getting engaged and helping us out. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. 
Oh, let me say this. This is kind of an interesting story <laughs> going back. And if you have any questions. Just no, this is great. Up, you, but... This is amazing. So w- when I was younger, I said that like, I, I only spoke Spanish. And when my parents were together, I was in a private school that only spoke Spanish. And when they got divorced, they couldn't afford to put me in a private school anymore. So I had to go to public school. And I had a really hard time understanding what people were saying. And I had this vivid memory of when I was younger, I had this teacher. And to me, she was like the size of a Christmas tree, just towering over me. And I remember one class in particular, she's asking everybody to draw a particular picture on a piece of paper. And I couldn't understand what she was saying. So I'm like looking around. People are drawing something different. So I'm like, I think I'm just going to draw, you know, whatever it was, a particular animal. And I remember her standing over me, looking at me, grabbing my piece of paper, crumpling it up, throwing it, putting down another piece of paper. And like, and so I'm like drawing, she does it again. And I like start crying because I'm like four. And she's yelling at me. And I'm like, I don't know what she's saying. Mm. I have no idea what she's saying. And I remember she held me after class and she's like, no, you know, pointing down, yelling at me. And I go home and my parents always, you know, get frustrated with me and they're like, you don't know Spanish anymore. And that was the moment where I, I went home as a four year old and said, nobody's ever going to treat me like that again. Mm. The reason why that person treated me like that is because I spoke Spanish. And as, as a four year old, I dropped Spanish somehow and just focused on learning English and kids pick things up quickly. And so my parents didn't know that, but that was a, that was a moment in my, in my youth where I, I was just like, I'll do whatever it takes for some for, for an adult or a parent not to get mad at me. Yeah. That was like a feeling I had. And so that, you know, couple that with my dad always laying guilt on me. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. I just don't want you to get mad at me. Yeah. Right. I'll do whatever it takes. So, yeah. So I, I go to college. I wander around college for three years because I have no idea what the heck I'm doing. I never understood how people would say, yeah, I'm going to go be an engineer. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? How do you know what you want to do? What if you want to change your mind? I've never understood like this stability, this just picking something, moving forward with it because I, stability was like the last yeah. thing I ever experienced at home. And so I didn't have a good foundation. I was always wishy-washy. I was close with my friends, closer than I was with my family. So I go to college and I waste three years at a private college, rack up a bunch of student loan debt and find myself kind of like a broken dude at age 20. Like my parents are out of the country. I have nowhere to live. I don't know what I'm going to do. I feel like a failure here, mm-hmm. like a big failure. And then God opens the door to a small Christian college in Lansing. They give me free tuition because my parents are missionaries. I develop strong relationships with professors who invite me over to their house at night. We have conversations, just a really big confidence booster. Like it, it always felt good. Like I, even to this day, I think there's a healthy aspect to where I so desire to want to be with older men and spend time with them and just understand them and ask questions and for them to be interested in me. I mean, I'm 37. I still desire that. Mm. Like who doesn't want to hang out with Mike Darnley? (laughs) You know (laughs) what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I told Mike Darnley, dude, people want to hang out with you, man. Like you're cool. You know, we, we want somebody who's been in the thick of it and Mm -hmm. is still on our side, like who is still following Christ. Like, we know, you know, Whitson, like, it's weird because Whitson, funny story, I asked for Nate Whitson's autograph when I was like in <laughs> fifth grade. He was a camp counselor for like a summer rec program. And he would, here's the cool thing about Whitson. He would s- sit down and have lunch with me. <laughs> he was like an all-star athlete. Like he was like, to me, like a, a, a celebrity. And he would sit down next to me at lunch and eat his little sandwich and i'd sit next to him just like i can't believe it because i think i think you're like 10 years older than me and so i remember i had a battle creeks battle a michigan battle cats hat it's a semi-pro battle creek baseball team hat that doesn't exist anymore he signed his autograph on it and i held that for years i tell his kids that but stuff like that i ate it up Mm -hmm. i ate it up any any older guy that wanted to Any older guy that wanted to show interest in me, mm-hmm. I ate it up. Mm-hmm. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. So I, in my, in my adulthood, 
didn't really have a friendship with my parents, with my with my dad or, or with Steve. And so I, I sought it out through other means. God provides, mm -hmm. right? So God, that's the that's the through line is God provided. God provided through Woodson. God provided through men that I worked with, that I went to church with. So um, I, <clears throat> so I meet my wife. We were friends for three years. And I, she was the kind of girl that I said, if I ever had the chance, I would marry her in a heartbeat. I got to know her for three years. She came to know Christ right before she went to college. She was a woman of faith. She had her own faith. She was solid as a rock. And I'm like, all right, like, <laughs> I need a woman like that. Checks no hesitation. All the boxes, yep. Checks all the boxes. Yep. And literally, I was working at Subway. She walked in one night. We had a conversation for two hours. We talked after work. And I said, I'm marrying this woman. Hmm. You know, four months later, I buy a ring. We get married 11 months after we start dating. And uh, hardest three months of my life after marriage. Hmm. I and, so? and this is like... <laughs> She, she, her, her parents had her when they were in high school. Her dad was a guy that you couldn't trust. Her mom was a woman who just wanted to feel safe with the guy. So she dated around. So a lot of instability. And so we came in with a ton of baggage. Mm. And we, when we did marriage, marriage counseling, our, our counselors identified certain things. They said, Nate, the very thing you need from your wife is the last thing she wants to give to a man mm -hmm. because of how she was hurt. And Kayla, the very thing you need from your husband is the last thing your husband will give you. So just know, if you feel this marriage is harder than what you think it should be, you're right. Mm. It's going to be harder. Now, that's not the end of the story, they said. But they identified, and they were right on. Mm. I mean, they were right on. My wife needed emotional safety, and she needed tons of validation to this day. And again, I'm not saying these in the things that like, oh, my wife needs validation. No, what, your wife needs validation. Yeah. <laughs> like they need to know that like they're safe with communicating how they feel because that's how they connect with you. And to me, it's when my wife would cry, when my wife would get frustrated. Oh, man, you got the worst out of me because here we go. Yeah, I know what that's like. My mom did that to me. Right. My mom's a psycho. You know, I, that's in my head. My mom is not trustworthy. My mom is trying to manipulate me. For years, mm -hmm. not just months, for years, I battled with that. And I still battle with that now. Mm -hmm. Because, but the, the good thing is, me and my wife, we go to marriage counseling. We have no shame about it because we need help. I don't always know what it is I'm trying to say or feel. I don't always know, like, what's what's somewhat normal. Where, like, I, I'll always be honest with you, mm -hmm. like, where I struggle, like, when I'm being a jerk. I'm like, yeah, I'm being a jerk right now, and I don't care. Like I have those moments, but what marriage counseling has helped us do is it's allowed me to trust her heart more and say, okay, I'm breaking these habits that I kept on without even realizing that I couldn't trust my mom's heart. I do believe she loved me. I just, her, how she treated me and the words she told me, they just cut so deep and they hurt so bad that I was just like, but my wife isn't my mom, right? <laughs> you right. know, she's not. And even if she was, I'm called to love her without contingencies. Mm. And so, so, you know, our marriage was just hard, super hard. And, and it was my inability to like, see how I was affecting. And that's why I went to county. It's like, please, somebody help us put the pieces together and give us like, give us like a whole top end view of what's going on. And it's been so helpful. So I need anybody out there that's thinking, Oh, if I'm going to marriage counseling, you know, something terrible is wrong. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It could be something big. It could be something where it's just like, we need maintenance. Yeah. We need routine maintenance, you know? Yeah. And I, I think our church would benefit from more people being more comfortable saying, yeah, you know, we should go to counseling because we're missing, we're, we're missing each other in some way mm -hmm. or fashion. Right. I obviously don't want to hate my wife or make her feel like I hate her, but like how I'm talking makes her feel like I'm the last person she wants to be around. Yeah. Is that really what I want? It's like, no, yeah. that's not what I want. You can't help but hear um, your story too. And just think, you know, piecing together, like you, you've done a masterful job at like piecing together these storylines of a broken woman meets a broken man, create a broken family that breaks yeah. further. Yeah. The, the woman, your mom marries a really broken man who <laughs> carries this on, but they start to break some chains. 
it's like very interesting and then like what what's amazing to listen to the story and the story is so so incredible is there's so much grace involved in it still god's grace mm -hmm. overwhelming the story is really incredible and yet things are still broke things are still hard <laughs> Like, yeah. and I think of, I think of like the empathy for a th person listening to this goes through the roof. This is why the fight club stories are so, so incredible. This is why when you go to church and you hear somebody's testimony, you just, you tear up and you're like, I can't breathe right now. Like listening to, <laughs> even listening to your story and I've known it, it, it just, yeah, it, yeah. it chokes you up because you're like this, like this young Nate didn't ask for any of this. And now 37 year old Nate is taking it into his relationships and he didn't ask yeah. for it. Kayla didn't ask for it. Your kids now didn't ask for two broken parents who were handed yeah. brokenness. Right. And so I, I think of all of that. And I think of the man that's listening to this, who just feels like the messages of who he is as a man feel so broken beyond repair. Speak to that guy for a minute because you i mean you walk this this story but I, there's a guy sitting in church today who feels so alone in his story of brokenness that he just he he doesn't he really really wonders if i'm a christian how can i still feel so broken mm -hmm. and i feel for yeah. that guy so deeply what do you say to him so i'm gonna get a little emotional here I think so many guys grow up feeling like they're on their own, like completely on their own, whether it was how their dad treated them, how their mom treated them. They don't really believe that they have anybody to lean on, that they have somebody who's got their back or who they can trust. And I think a lot of men and, and certainly women too, but just the way men are treated, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like we are not taught how to be, open and vulnerable because it was never, it's not safe. Mm -hmm. So if you felt like you were cut off of like how, like, this is how I feel. And with, I can, ex, I can explain it with clarity. I'm 37. I'm starting to learn how to share how I feel with clarity. If you're not able to do that, it's inherently a lonely place to be mm -hmm. because you don't feel understood. Yep. And what we do is we just shove dirt over it and say, I'm just going to push forward. It's not manly. It's not, you know, crying for sissies. I cry, as you can see, <laughs> so much more in my life as I've gotten more clarity as to how I feel. Yeah. And again, I'm going back to anger. Men use anger so broadly and it covers up sadness. It covers up feeling frustrated. It covers up feeling loss, grief, mourning. Like I look back at like now that I have kids, I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, like there was a lot of grieving that I didn't know how to do when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I was treated wrong and I never felt like I could say that was wrong. That's a lonely place to be. And so if you're, if you're a guy out there that like you resonate, like, yeah, I grew up with a deadbeat dad with a mom who was, let's say a single mom who did her best, mm -hmm. but you can't take the role of two parents. You know, I grew up with a single mom to some extent. My sister is a single mom. You just can't meet the needs like you can with both parents. And it makes kids feel lonely. Doesn't mean they, you're not going to be successful in your career or your relationships, but like it keeps you from understanding the power of community. And that, that has been the blessing for me as I've had to go outside of my comfort zone and seek relationships out with men and connect with them and be open with them and cry with them. And it's been so healing. And it's scary mm -hmm. because you don't know if it's going to get reciprocated. You don't know if you can trust them fully because that's, you know, at the heart of it is like, who can I trust? Yeah. And then you say, am I a needy person? It's like, you absolutely are. That's a good thing. You have needs in Christ community meets those needs, not perfectly. But if you're, if you're some guy out there who's got a ton of frustration, a ton of hurt and anger, and you're keeping it to yourself, like open up to one of us. Mm -hmm. Like you can come to me anytime at church. I'll make the time for you. You know, I'll make the time for you. Nate will make the time for mm -hmm. you. You know, like 
people, there are people out there who will make the time for you. You know, I've been blessed by people who made time for me. And uh, I, I just, to me, I, my heart goes out to guys that mm-hmm. just feel like they have to do it on their own. And it's an impossible job. Mm-hmm. It just is. And if you're a parent, your husband, I mean, that's a lot on your plate. You can't do it by yourself. I promise you, you can't. Yeah. yeah. And it's really the, it's the birthplace of this ministry for Christian men that I feel that deep burden of seeing men without a friend, the stats that are out there. I can't, I wish I could give you the, the sourcing of this, but, and I can't remember exactly offhand, but there was some uh, research that was done talking about the loneliness that's out there today. And it was somewhere near 25% of those polled in this huge national poll felt like they didn't have one friend, one friend. And, and then you add on the story of what you're saying, Nate, and you mentioned it in the very beginning, this is a very common story. How sad is that? To listen to your yeah. story develop, to know it. And then again, to think of all these men that I don't know that are listening, thinking what you carry with you is shame that I wasn't enough, that, that message that you get from the devil who wants to kill you and destroy you comes with messages of why am I such a wuss? Because I feel <laughs> up this way. Why am I not the man that I'm supposed to be that the world wants me to be this man who's not harmed by this stuff. And I'm so harmed that I lash out. You mentioned that, you know, yeah. like where anger covers over we almost wear it like it's supposed to be this badge of honor. Like, Oh, that's what strong guys look like. No, that's what the weakest of us look like. Right. And yet we bring it into our homes and we're like, you know, how do you explain to your wife? If you're a man that you're hurting my feelings, (laughs) like that feels like the wimpiest thing I could ever say. And yet, you know what, when you respond in anger to your wife, it's typically because she hurt your feelings. 100%. I, you either get like, I honestly think this is the role of mothers is to teach their sons how to, with clarity, Mm -hmm. you know, with safety, say, this is how I feel. Like, really, it's the role of both parents, but the mom, because that's where I learned it wasn't safe. So it might be your mom, might be your dad, but you were taught somewhere. It's not safe to do that. And thus, there's no value in it. And and again, I, I use the word clarity so much because when I can take time in my own life to just know what exactly it, it is that I'm, I'm feeling, because we, we, we trounce on, on the words, emotions and feelings. We say facts don't care about your feelings, right? It's a Ben Shapiro statement. It's like, okay, that's fine in certain arenas. But when you're trying to develop as a man mm-hmm. who's trying to love your kids, your spouse, yourself, your God, you need to understand, you need to have that clarity of like, this is what it is mm-hmm. because it might take time. But when I tell my wife, you know, that hurt, that really hit me where I'm sorest. I'm waiting for somebody to attack me there. And I felt like you mm-hmm. did. And that I stung it bad versus lashing out in anger, mm-hmm. getting frustrated, puffing up my chest. Two different responses from my wife. Mm-hmm. One response, the first one, my wife feels connected to me. And I get apologies. I get love back. And it feels amazing because it's so new, even to this day, where the other one just feels familiar. I'm going to roar and defend myself like I did when I was a little kid. We're not going to be close, but you're sure as heck going to know how I feel. Mm-hmm. And so then in those moments, right, they call it an amygdala hijack, fight or flight. You don't allow your thoughts to come all the way. Boom. You just go with what's been the habit over and over again. Anger, anger, anger. I'm going to let you know how I feel rather than I'm going to connect with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And women want us to connect even when they hurt us. They like, again, it comes down to trusting your wife's heart. And if that's not there, work on that. Yeah. Go to counseling have conversations, make the time for it. It's never convenient. Yep. It's never fun, but you connect with your wife and you probably have sex more. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. like, I'm serious. Yeah. Like when you're, when you're, yeah, I've seen it in my life and I, I trust me, I'm not perfect at it. I swear I go into ebbs and flows mm-hmm. too, but I just know 
I, I'm aware of like when things are in a in a valley, I know why now. Like I know why. So let me add some let me add some redemption to the story. Yeah. So so I know I'm getting married to my wife for a few months out from our marriage. Woodson knows the story. And growing up, I was like, all right, so I've got Robert, who was my biological dad. I've always called him Robert because dad mm-hmm. felt almost like I like I, I, I didn't like saying dad around Steve. I've always called Steve Steve. And to me, that's more endearing than dad because dad met this guy that was removed and, you know, you know, just kept me up arm's length and told me I was not enough. I was not enough. You're not good enough. You're not of use. You're not good enough. I would, Steve was always accessible, always playful, but he wasn't as assertive as I wish he would have been. Now, still an awesome dad. But I said, I, uh, all right, I'm getting married. My family's going to carry on a name of some sort. My biological dad was always obsessed about his last name. When you have a son, you're going to name him this. He's going to have my last name, blah, blah, blah. And I said, growing up, like, F you. You care about traditions. You never cared about the relationship, mm-hmm. ever, ever. So I said, my last name is going to carry on the man who changed my life, who led me to Christ. And that's Steve. So I said, I've got to tell my biological dad that I'm going to change my last name to Byron's. It used to be Basilla. I'm going to make Basilla part of my middle name because that's still part of who I am. And I said, I got to tell, I got to tell Robert. I got to tell him in person because I think that's what a man would do. But I was scared. It's the scariest, one of the scariest moments ever. Mm-hmm. So I sat down with him. I said, hey, I just want to let you know. <sighs> it's not so much that what you did do or didn't do, but I didn't ask to have two dads. And this other guy, you would even admit, has done a pretty good job of raising me. And I, I don't know what to do with this. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to do with this. And I've always felt like I was on a teeter-totter, balancing me my whole life between these two men. But I, I'm changing my last name to his last name. And I don't care how crappy your dad was to you. That's a hard conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, because my dad, I do believe, loved me, loves me. I think he did his best. I say that now. But it does kind of hurt me to know that no matter what he did where I felt justified to do it, it wasn't to like get at him. Mm-hmm. It really never was. I was just like, I, 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 I need, a, I have your flesh and blood. You'll ne- nothing could take away from that. But I want, I want him to have my family's last name because without, and I told my dad, like without him, I, my family won't know Christ. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's, that's more important than flesh and blood. And I expected him to get angry and he did. He's like, you know, get the hell out of my house. You know, I don't want to see you again. I'm like, I know, I get it, I get it. Mm. I thought he would cool off. Well, Steve didn't know I was changing my last name to his last name. And so one day when, because you have to go to a courtroom and they do all the paperwork and it gets finalized in front of a judge, I asked Steve, I said, hey, can you go to lunch with me sometime? Actually, can we go to lunch tomorrow? I got to go to the courtroom to grab some stuff for the wedding and then we can have lunch afterwards. He's like, sure. So we go to the courtroom, we go in a courtroom. Mm. And he's sitting back there and I'm sitting in front. He's like, why are we in a courtroom with a judge? This is, I thought you had to pick up like a wedding license or something. I go, I don't know. This is just where they told me. <laughs> this I need is to awesome. Be. I don't know. And so I'm sitting there and the judge is just reading through paper. He's looking at me. He looks at Steve. He's like, Nathaniel? I'm like, yes. He goes, is this Steve? I go, yeah. And he addresses Steve. He goes, he goes sir. He goes, must be a, must be a pretty happy day for you. And Steve's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, he goes, what an honorable thing to do. He goes, this young man now has your last name. <laughs> and to me, mm-hmm. so like, it'll always get me. It was like, I never cared about the last name because of my relationship with my dad. But this was the first time it was just like, like what a blessing, what a gift I can give you. I can give you my last name. Because if it wasn't for you, my family wouldn't be where they are right now. Mm-hmm. And it just blew him away. And we had lunch and it was great. And But nobody else knew. Yeah. And so we kept it hush-hush until the wedding day. And it wasn't until Steve Steve married me and Kayla. And it wasn't until we were all up there where he told the crowd, <laughs> you know, that this family is going from Basilica to Byron's. And from this moment forward, the kids will be named Byron's. And 
it was just mm -hmm. an awesome experience and I, I don't regret it, but there were for years, I would try to have a relationship with my dad. He could never drop that. He would always bring sure. it up. He's like, I don't understand sure. your kids, your son. Mm -hmm. He just always made it about the last name and it just pushed me further away. And it came to a breaking point where I'm like, you're out of my life for good. You're causing, like, I'm getting so angry. I would, I'd get off the phone with him. I'd get so angry. I'd punch something. I'd go downstairs and I'd cry by myself after a few minutes when really that's what I want to do the whole time. Mm. <laughs> it's just cry. But it's so much easier to like hit something that hurt, mm -hmm. you know, like I never like want to take it. Out. I wanted to hurt myself. I, I've broken so many bones, punching and kicking things. It's just like, but at the end, it was just like, man, this man is hurting me. He's hurting me. I just didn't know that's what it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know what it was like to explain that. So. My wife goes, you should probably go see a counselor. <laughs> and I said, fine. And I met with, I meet with Darren Moore, who is the freak of the man. Mm -hmm. And he goes, why are we meeting here? And I go, I don't know. I don't know. And I meet with him for a few times. And I tell him, I go, listen, you're driving from Olivet to Lansing because I'm living in Lansing at the time. I go, I'll just come to you per need. And because I just felt bad, he was doing it on his own dime, mm -hmm. like wasn't charging me anything. And so I went and met a Christian counselor at the Gilead Healing Center at Mount Hope Church. And it's a perfect fit. So if you go for anybody there, if you're going to see a counselor, it's not a good fit. Try again. Mm -hmm. You got to find a good fit. That's so important. My first day with this counselor, he goes, why are you here? I go, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know. My wife thinks I need to be here. And he goes, well, just tell me about yourself. So I open up and I start talking. I cry a little bit like I did today. I talk for about 45 minutes and he stops and he just looks at me like silently. And I'm just like, what is he thinking? And he says three words. He goes, <laughs> He goes, you're a good man. And I just lose it. <laughs> like I was in my, I'm, I'm 37. I was 34, 35. And I don't remember the last time saying you're anybody saying you're a good man. Mm -hmm. And that was like, I desperately wanted to hear that from somebody mm -hmm. from a, from an older man. You're a good man. I didn't want to believe that I, let people down or I'm not good enough for my parents or, or my dad, because again, like I'm a son to their father. You're supposed to tell them you're good. Mm -hmm. It is well, like I, I hold you, I take you in, like you're not going anywhere. And I never, I got, I never got that, but God provided this concert to like, he knew instantly you're a good man. And so I even get emotional now thinking about that, not only because I'm starting to believe it yep. without being conceited, but, you know, it was, it just felt good. It felt good. I don't care how old I am. I don't care how old anybody is. You need somebody saying those things. To you. you need somebody speaking life into mm -hmm. you because this world wants to just run all over you and tell you that just even being a man is a detriment to society and it's just mm -hmm. not. And so I, I, I started to overcome my past. That's what Compton is supposed to do, overcome your past. So I truly don't look at the past anymore and hold that, hold myself hostage to that. I truly have forgiven my dad. And the, the cool thing is like two years ago, my biological dad found Christ mm. after regret. Like I remember at one point saying like, I can't wait for him to die. So I don't have to deal with them anymore mm. because I do feel, I felt guilty that there's this guy here that I just don't want to be around, but he found Christ. And he's soft and he's gentle. My kids love being around him. Mm. And like a month ago, month or two ago, I met up with him for his birthday, took him out for dinner. And he just told me for the first time ever, he looked at me and he cried. He's like, I'm so proud of who you are and the family that you had and that your daughters love Christ. And he comes and he prays over my kids. And he tell, tells them about scripture. And it's like, I was willing to like say, all right, like that just sucks that I had a dad that just wasted his life. 
I didn't plan on this, and that's what what's so amazing about Christ is like he takes the improbable and makes it reality. And it's like I now have a relationship with my dad that is like spiritually edifying. My kids want to be around him, and I can trust him that he's gonna tell them about Christ and he loves Christ. I mean, he's a different man. And it's just like my life is so at peace. That was like the one thing where I was like willing to concede, mm. like, all right, unfortunately it didn't go the way it planned, but like and I'm not looking for a father. I'm looking for a friend and somebody that I can, you know, and, and more than that, somebody I can serve. And so it's like, like I'm at such peace, mm. regardless of all that, because Christ did a work. He took my begrudging prayers. I didn't really feel like I wanted to pray for that man. But God is faithful mm. because, my, you know, he, he takes our faith and makes things perfect. And it's just like it's it's unbelievable and like i said it gives me a great amount of peace and uh now i still i still get angry and i still have fights with my wife <laughs> you know in the midst of all this and i just know that i, I know things aren't going to be made perfect now in this world but i i definitely teach my kids forgiveness mm -hmm. and i apologize to them i and i ask how they feel and i validate them and i let them know like dad dad was wrong mm -hmm. you know last week i i lost it i spilled my food that i just brought home i slammed the fridge and the oranges just collapsed and it makes this loud it just makes it so dramatic yeah. and maya's right there and maya starts crying i'm like why are you crying why are you crying and i and kayla's like go go to your office and i'm just freaking looking for something to hit because i'm pissed off at myself yeah. And I realized, okay, just freaking breathe, yep. breathe, <laughs> you know, take control. And uh, I had to go to my, my daughter and I let her ask all the questions she wanted. And she's like, why, why did you tell me not to cry? Mm. <laughs> and I go, because I didn't want to take responsibility over what I did. Dad didn't want to be responsible and I'm sorry, you know, I'll do better. And I've come to the point where it's like, yeah, that was not right. Like you should never feel that that what dad did was mm -hmm. right. Don't don't try to find a way to explain it because that's what happens if you don't apologize. If you don't approach your kids after you do something wrong, what they do is they say, all right, how do I reconcile with this my tiny brain? Yep. You make you normalize it. Say, all right, that wasn't wrong, and you makes it acceptable. And then next thing you know, you're around people that are like that. And I want my kids to know, like, dad was wrong. Mm -hmm. This is not good or acceptable. And I thank God that he's allowed me to reach out to people and resources and tools to get me to that point yep. because that would have never happened. Yep. And so I'm not here letting you know I'm a finished product. I'll never be a finished product. But I'm hopefully in my failures can bring redemption and teach. Because, again, if you're in any kind of meaningful relationship, you're going to have to forgive. I don't care who you yep. are. You're going to have to take responsibility and you're going to have to be humble. And kids are the easiest. <laughs> kids give you plenty of opportunity to do that. And so, yeah, there's a there's God's reconciled a ton in my life, and I'm breaking chains and doing things that I wasn't taught. And just because you weren't taught, it doesn't mean you can't learn That's it. That's right. You gotta seek out those people and those resources. Yeah, so, it's powerful, man. Yeah. Holy cow! Woo. wasn't expecting all that, but that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, just awesome. And yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like, you know, you're breaking chains. And I'm, and I'm thinking of the guys listening to this who are relating with you so much and just like wondering, like, what do I, what do I do next? You know, and the reality is win today, right? Have, have, have a community that you belong to may be the most important thing because there are men like Nate said a while ago that, that will build you up, that will encourage you, that will share with you messages that you need to hear. And it doesn't make you less of a man. It just makes you human, you know, and, and we yeah. just, we have a lot of older men who are still broken kids inside and they're raising families yeah. and grandkids and they hate it about themselves and they just don't know what to do. And, and so, you know, this is a opportunity for you to turn to Christ. Number one, I mean, the story of redemption yeah. in your biological dad's life the the story of what he did for Steve and for your mom, what he's doing for you, 
right? It, it's unbelievable that grace is just weaved in and out of all of our broken stories. It is the story of God. He is the one that we worship and praise because only God can do that in Robert's life. Yeah. In, in fact, only God can do that in Nate Whitson's life, in Nate Byron's life. <laughs> it's only a grace. I'm not... Lo- I'm not less of a miracle than my dad. I'm just as deserving or not as deserving, but like I'm like, like Paul says, like I'm the greatest sinner of all. Like who, who do I think, think like, I don't need that miracle as much as him. And that's, and I think that's one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking in my mind here as we, as we get ready to close up here is how, how do we as men, find that empathy and forgiveness inside us that is so necessary to not have to hold on to these chains longer than we have to, you know, any, any closing thoughts and in, in helping men, maybe in thinking of your own journey, like how did you go? At what point do you start to find that empathy and forgiveness that you needed in order to get stronger? I mean, I, I said it again, I can't convince people to, to go to counseling, but if you find a counseling worth their weight, they're trying their very best to say, that is not your identity, your past, you know, like, like understand what happened, understand you're a Christian and that it's your duty to forgive. Like (laughs) it is your duty and responsibility to forgive. Mm -hmm and what forgiveness looks like and, and to understand in, again, community, 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 Mm -hmm. like you would need that feedback. You need people talking and speaking in your life and seeing these patterns and being confident enough to speak them and saying, Hey, like, I know you're struggling. I see this, you know, just, just bringing awareness. I mean, that awareness piece is so important for, for really any of this is you, you can't fix what you don't understand is broken. And how do you, how do you understand what's broken is you start having meaningful, scary, emotional conversations with the start with other yep. men. That's what this fight club would fight. You know, this, this whole thing is meant for is connecting and, and feeling vulnerable. People have done it. And so I think you having podcasts like this, you can only provide tools, mm-hmm. right? And people need to receive them. And I I try to do my best with the time that I have connecting with guys. And and so if you're any, if anybody whoever's listening to this, please make it a goal to connect with somebody once a mm-hmm. week. It's really not that hard. You walk away feeling energized and exhausted at the same mm-hmm. time, but it's so you you feel bought in and you feel understood. And you, you have no idea what that could mean for somebody. Um, yeah, that's right. We're just, men are just dying, dying to connect and to feel understood and heard. And, you know, I think what Nate's going to provide in coaching and, and what I could provide too is, is giving us the tools to not only heal ourselves and to be emotionally, emotionally aligned, but to also expand that to our brothers yep. in Christ and to, to, to lend them some tools that we've taken from other people. Like it's, it's not about us. We, we, we have these tools so that we can connect with other people better. And so, yeah, just please reach out, send me a message, shoot me a text, come up to me at church. I will make the time for you. Whitson will make the time for you. There are men that will make the time for you. I promise you. And we can only affect our local area, right? Like the people in our church, the guys that we see every day. So you know, I'm here to talk about anything as long as you like. Yeah. That's so awesome. Well, Nate, thank you, man. Wow. Like that is, even if you know the story, it's, it's just powerful. And I appreciate you just opening up and, and, and sharing the story. And I know that the Lord will use it for guys that are listening. And I just want to reiterate as we close up here, what Nate was saying, like go to counseling, talk to somebody at your church. Don't keep it in go to get in the fight.club and join us where Nate and I come on every day. And we just are part of this community of just broken men trying to live bigger, better lives and live out the purpose that God has for us. You know, you cannot be the man that God meant for you to be. You know, you are not an accident. You have great purpose. You have great opportunity and you want to be a better man. We all do. And if that's you and you're not sure where to go, Start here, get in the fight.club 
And, and like Nate said, like it's a community where you can find guys like him where you can just get connected and say like, man, this guy's story resonates. Can I chat with you about it? And Nate's telling you, <laughs> join this community and chat with him, let him know. And, and he will listen. And, you know, there's coaching involved that, that if you want it, if you need it, there's just community, there's the word of God, there's an opportunity that you don't have to feel alone. And I, I hope you hear that in Nate's story and, and in my communicating that to you, you're not alone, that we're here for you. The church is here for you. And we want to see you become the man that God meant for you to be. So if you listen to the story today and, and it stands out to you, will you do me a favor and just copy the link and send it to a friend that needs to hear it? You know, if you want to follow on Instagram and share your stories there and, and copy this and share it with some other guys, there's a lot of guys that are going to relate to this story. And if it relates to you, will you just serve somebody by sharing it with them? It makes all the difference in the world. But listen, we say this all the time. Hope you have a great day but we want you to get in the fight. So go after it, become the man that God meant for you to be and get in the fight. We'll see you soon. Hey guys, thanks so much for being here today and listening to the show. Please be sure to head over to the website at getinthefight.club. And before you go, if you haven't already, please subscribe, click the like button and leave us a positive five-star review. It makes a huge difference whenever you do. Have a great day. Go get in the fight.